Glasgow, a bustling metropolis, with nearly 600,000 inhabitants. But Scotland's largest city would be nothing were it not for this. A pipeline, 26 miles long, that supplies the city with fresh highland water from Loch Katrin. Hewn through rock and scaling valleys, it's a feat of Victorian engineering. Built with astonishing precision, there are over 80 tunnels, 25 aqueducts, capable of carrying 50 million gallons of water every day. And over 150 years later, it's still going strong. What a testament to the skill of the engineers and navvies who built it. But how and why did such an ambitious and audacious structure ever come to be built? In the 19th century, Glasgow grew at a phenomenal rate. As industry boomed, the population soared. By 1841, there were over a quarter of a million people living in the city. While a few made their fortune, the majority lived in grinding poverty. Conditions were dire. Clean water from private wells, the preserve of the rich. The Clyde, contaminated with industrial waste, was an open sewer. Thousands died in the cholera and typhoid outbreaks in 1831, 1847, 1848 and 1853. Families were crowded, often several to a room. Human waste was tipped from buckets high above onto the streets below and you didn't want to be walking past at the time. In Scotland, one observer wrote, had a time-honoured tradition of dirt, both inside and outside the house. Filth and squalor prevailed everywhere, but they reached their extremes in the towns. Clearly, something had to be done. In 1848, the Public Health Act gave local authorities responsibility for the supply of clean water and the disposal of sewage. It was a civil engineer from Yorkshire, John Bateman, who concluded that the fine quality of the waters of Loch Katrin could meet the city's needs. The House of Commons threw out the plan, but thanks to the dogged determination of Glasgow's Lord Provost, Robert Stewart, construction was finally given the go-ahead in 1855. Today, those who work in the water industry marvel at the sheer scale and endeavour of what was achieved. So the landscaping was done at the same time as the building of the aqueduct? Yes, yes, it would have been all part of the original plan from Bateman. So Louise, here we are at the Mogai Reservoir, where the water reaches the end of its journey. Mm -hmm. But how does it actually work? Well, the 26 mile long aqueduct um, is uh, extraordinary precision needed. It's uh, an 8 foot by 8 foot channel and it falls only 10 inches every mile to actually get here um, entirely by gravity. Who would have actually have built it? Well, there'd been a huge workforce from all over the UK, um, Scotland, Ireland and England. And in fact, in some areas, uh, the workforce had their own encampments like Round Loch Con, um, and that actually even had its own school. Really? Yeah. And even though there was such a large workforce, did it take a long time to construct? It didn't take too long. I mean, it took three years to build the 26 miles of aqueduct. But in some areas, the, the progress was very slow. Um, around Loch Con, they were doing three to four yards per month. And that was even with the workforce working around the clock and drilling and blasting using gunpowder. So this was before dynamite? Then? Yes. Of course. Well, please lead on. Yeah, we'll more. see the rest. According to John Bateman, at its peak, around 3,000 people were employed, excluding the iron founders. At the head of Loch Con, the turf and timber village, nicknamed Sebastopol, was constructed, home to several hundred people with stores, a schoolhouse, church and reading rooms. On the 14th of October, 1859, Queen Victoria stood on this very spot to officially open a marvel of engineering. Using a silver handle, she opened a sluice and the pure waters of Loch Katrin flooded through. Its destination, the city of Glasgow. It's the hydrology of the Great Trossachs Forest area, with its rich mosaic of moorland and woodland that makes the water so pure. Rainfall falling across thousands of acres finds its way into the myriad of burns that feed Loch Katrin. Today, more than 70% of the water used by Glaswegians comes from Loch Katrin. The Stuart Memorial Fountain in Kelvin Grove Park honours the former Lord Provost Robert Stuart. 
the man whose foresight and determination brought fresh water to the city. We all take clean running water for granted, but the Victorians didn't. They knew it was vital to improve public health and to ensure that society prospered. And today, these waters remain the lifeblood of one of our greatest cities.